I think you've pushed a button there. I can see your screen. Oh, can you? Yeah. <laughs> right. um. It's a real slippery table, see? It's like this. That's why it's doing it. It's slippery yep. as fuck. Give me a second. I'll find a, something a bit sturdier. Right. Sturdy. Beautiful. Bang a couple of nails in. Yeah, I reckon. Ah, oh, cracked it. All right. Awesome. Yeah, yeah cool. Right. So what's Rocky up to? Uh, oh, he just said to say, you know, yeah, he's back shearing now, so he's living the yeah. dream. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is cool. Yeah, I heard. Uh, I, I actually I messaged him to see if he wanted to do a episode. Um, oh, talking gear. I didn't realise you'd you'd um, left Heiniger. Yeah, only probably for oh, maybe six weeks, two months, maybe. Yeah, not long. Yeah. But um, yeah. Right. How's his back holding up? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. He's yeah. actually over here at the moment working for Johnny Cade. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that'll test yeah. it out. They're pretty physical sheep over here at um yeah. in Hawks Bay. Yeah. Hard out. Oh, I um. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I was over, like, I stayed on a week after the World Champs a couple of years ago, down around Gore. Yeah. When I was, and that's when I was working at Heinegger and fuck, like, um, I was cramping up from the first day, and then like from the first run Tuesday, I was, yeah, I was just cramping up the whole time, just sweating my guts out and just getting. I was shearing less. I was shearing like fifty-five a run. I couldn't bloody drag the sheep out down there. They're too big for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely if you're not used to it, it's different, different game over there. Oh yeah, she's physical, man. Like you cut your hat off to people that that work over here full time, and like seeing just sitting like yeah, the big wheels just sitting on like a hundred a run, just it's like wow, yeah. Yeah, human beings. You know, man. I reckon even just that week I did there, I got a new perspective on like. It's a different sort of fitness shearing in New Zealand, I think. Like your arms working a lot harder. You're working a lot harder to hold the sheep too. Like you gotta be physically stronger than shearing merinos all the time. Yeah, Do you find I think, that? think um, Oh yeah, hundred percent. So um Doug Smith actually said to me, because I do a lot of work with Doug like on the daily sort of thing. And um he was saying how maybe in merinos you sort of lead with your blow first, like with your hand, but in New Zealand you've actually got to lead with your feet first. So if your feet aren't in front of what are you doing, if you're not leading with those, yeah, you're yep. in all sorts of trouble. Which is true, though. Like once you start thinking of it like that, that's when you can start dancing around them a bit more and you can sort of – you've got to keep moving. While they're moving, they're sort of – they're sitting there and you can sort of do what you want to do with them a bit. But as soon as you sort of get stagnant with it, then, yeah, she's on. Yeah, she's on my you, don't, you don't want to give them any opportunity to think. No, yeah. exactly right. Yeah, as soon yeah, as they start don't... looking around, you're buggered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. How long have you been over there now? Um, started on about the thirteenth of May, I think. So I've done about five weeks, six weeks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you got another another six Probably. weeks over there. Something like that. Yeah, I come home early August. Yeah. So coming home early August, and then yeah, I'm actually going to move over to WA for a couple of years. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. Packed up my whole house. Yeah. Packed her up. She's in storage, and then I uh, meet my little girl and. Oh, pair are going to cruise over there. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, so we got a little bit of family over there. So um, Stella's auntie on her mum's side lives in Bustleton. And um, I've yep. done a couple of seasons over there already with Crackers, Mark Buscombe at Quinn Denning. So I'm going to go back there. Oh, and yeah. Yep. No, it's a good outfit. It's good. I like it over there. It's productive and, yeah, good people. Some good yeah, shearers so over how, there. Too. How's, yeah. your, um, how's your daughter like travelling around? Loves it, mate. She loves it. She's very yeah. cruisy. She's had it. yeah, no, she's very resilient. She probably hasn't had a normal upbringing, that's for sure. But um, 
No, she loves it. She just cruises around, goes with the flow. She's pretty lucky here because she's got um, a couple of little friends in Rolly's kids as well, which is yep. sort of with them a couple nights a week sort of thing. And he's got a daughter sort of one year older, daughter one year younger, and then he's got another boy sort of a couple of years under that. Yeah. From Stella. Yeah, yeah, we, no, did, we did a oh, similar thing with our kids. We just had a caravan when they were two and – or one and – we went for like 18 months. So my daughter was like one year old or well, six months old when we went travelling actually till she was about two. And um, my son – he wasn't cut out for it. Yeah, like, right, Ill. He didn't. He didn't like the constant change, eh? So, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's true. Yeah. So, Stella being an only child, though, she's sort of, I don't know, she's got to go with the flow a little bit. And through Haley's sort of illness and that, she's had to, yeah, she just sort of just adapts to whatever's going on, going on, sort of thing. Yeah. So, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty lucky there. She's not like a crazy daredevil or anything like that. She's pretty cruisy and she just does her own thing. Yeah, it's good. I'm lucky yeah, like that. Yeah, Otherwise, how old is yeah, she? she's four in two or three days. Three days. Yeah, right. Cool. Yeah. Are you, so, so you're thinking of settling in WA for school and that sort of thing? Um. Well, she's she's walked into like a preschool sort of system over there now, but um, yep. we'll see how it all goes and um, it's sort of like living in another country over there to a degree, like from New South Wales. Like, it's closer to be here in Hawke's Bay than <laughs> in, in uh, Bunbury, but um, yeah, it was good. Yeah. Mate, like I get over there, like the sheep are definitely more favourable, I think, for shearers around yeah. that Quindem area than yep. where yep. I'm based in Young, so just um, see how it all goes and yeah, just, yeah. Just going to wing it a bit, I suppose. But it's sort of not worth – originally I sort of didn't have to go over there that long. But for me to move all my furniture and everything over there, like it's a few thousand dollars to ship your stuff across four and a half thousand Ks. So yep. I thought I might as well go over there. And, I, like, I like working for Crackers and that. Like, he's a good good, good man and um, worked for him and Sarah. I thought I might as well just commit for a couple of years and Stella was still only being kindergarten then, so. Yeah, what yeah. about – like, his um... – have the sheep numbers affected that decision in New South Wales? Because that'd be... No, I haven't took that into account, no. no. Yeah, right. no, I got that... a mate, mate working yeah. out of Tottenham. I was talking to him yesterday and he said, like, the num- like they're going to finish up next week when normally yeah. they'd be working through to nearly November. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, it's obviously yeah, so... a bit more market out there. Young's very reliable. Like, I was talking to oh, a yeah. farm. And he was saying he's not even feeding sheep at the moment. So yeah, right. Yeah, yeah it's probably, so there's probably good spots and bad spots. I guess yeah. it's a big state. Yeah. yeah well, young like it's. A, I I love it. It's a great place. I'm more than happy to settle there the rest of my life. But I know there's a few things there that I know the shearing industry probably isn't where it could be, perhaps. But um. Yep. Yeah. So I just cruise around and chase a bit of cream for a little while. Why not? Well, I still got a couple of years <laughs> up this. Uh, at school, so. Yeah. What do you mean by the industry not being where it could be? Um, uh, yeah, it's a tricky one. A bit political question, that one. Um, yeah, probably just without like dobbing anybody in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just my political opinion, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not eight-hour days. It's like five o'clock days and there's a lot of whinging and they got, they, they're got they pretty well looked after, like payment-wise and different yeah. things. And I don't know, it's a lot of just whinging and carrying on and you don't really need that, eh? If you've got enough things going on in your life in the background that people don't see, then go to work, sit around with them for 10 hours and listen to them whinge about, you know, just shit. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't, to be honest, like, there's, you know, they don't know how lucky they got it. So, yeah. Yeah, but, um, yeah, just go and chase a bit of cream and keep working towards a few goals and that's my plan anyway, mate. Try not to get involved. I know everyone runs their own race and they've all got stuff going on in the background, so... I just worry about keeping my head in the right place. Yeah. that It seems like there's definitely a sort of whinging culture in maybe the Australian shearing industry, yeah. more so I'd say than, than the New Zealand industry. Like they tend to be yeah. more like head down, ass up and do the job. Oh. They sit like they, no doubt they can still complain about shit, but they tend to work through it. But I yeah. think the Aussie industry tends to sit down a bit more, but then you can't argue with the fact that the Aussie industry is probably where you want to work, do most of your work. 
Like that's conditions yeah, are probably yeah. a bit better. And maybe that the whinging and the better conditions go hand in hand. You know what I mean? Like, mate. Yeah, maybe. take nothing away from Aussie people and or hand wool handlers, shearers, presses that, you know, do work through it as well. Like it yeah. probably might be a little bit more predominantly whinging in Australia, maybe, but um <laughs> yeah, there's some good buggers out there that, that work through a lot of shit too. So credit to those guys as well. But for yeah. example, like um yes was it yesterday? No, day before. Um, we had a presser, he couldn't come to work. So um, the rouseabouts just jumped in. We were doing a bit of belly crutching. And, um, like, we had three girls there. One just worked the whole board for four belly crutches. One penned up these, like, you know, they weren't the smallest ewes in the world. They were pretty staunchy, sort of flighty sort of ewes. And then another girl, she got on the crank down and press, and they just done that all day. Split sheds. Yeah. No one whinged. Just got the job done. It was just like... Wow, I, I admire that sort of stuff because, you know, in Australia, like you see them work through their smokos and stuff like those presses on those crank downs and that, quick, quickly do a butt, which isn't as quick as it is in a TPW, then run out, pen all your sheep up so they're nice and warm for you. When you start the next yeah. run, it's just like, wow, credit to them. I just sit there in, in awe of them, really. I'm just like, wow, you know, and yeah. just cruise around. And in Australia, like if someone had to do that in the middle of their smoko, it's bloody near the end of the world sometimes. <laughs> But not all yeah, them, yeah. I, I, I remember I worked for a team up around um, around Wagga, and like good, like good guys to work with and everything. But just it was a different culture from where I'd come from, where it was like after a couple of days, like started with a new new shed with a new group of guys. I was like, "What time are we working to?" And they're like, um, "Quarter to five, knock off." I was like, yeah. okay, like when in Rome, it was, you know, a 40 minute drive home or something. And we all went in the same, same van. And, um, but to them, a quarter to five knockoff means they're all packed up in the bus at quarter to five. And I was still shearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was yeah. like, uh, like I did that for two days and I was like, fuck, I'm just going to drive my own car and work, you know, I'll work till five or whatever. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's, yes. That's why yeah. the whole thing, I think, is a bit of a saga. You know what I mean? Like, fair yeah. enough, the argument sort of with the award, you know, you work uh, so many hours a week, and that, that's cool. That's how it is on paper. Well, that, that's how people can approach it, I suppose. They're in their right to, but I don't know. It's like, you got eight hours a day to make a living. You know, if you've got kids and a mortgage and, you know what I mean, like, why why shouldn't you utilise that? So it's a bit of a, I don't know, divided line, but, yeah, that's why I like yeah. the whole idea. Yeah. Thing. And it's just easy. There's no arguments. And hey, there's no like pull up here, pull up there. You just worked your eight hours a day and yeah, sweet. It's easy. It's good. Yeah, to work but, with. and like I think that's also the beauty of our industry is you can go and find a team that fits you. You know what I mean? That's like, right. Yeah, you can move that, around. Yeah, you don't have to apply for a job. You just pick up the phone and hopefully you know, you've got like, a friend that knows um, Good news yeah. travels around. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I know. That's what I did. I tried to find people that I wanted to work with and try and swindle my way in there a little bit. And yeah. yeah, it's worked out for me. So that's good. Yeah. Right. Hmm. I, I think that's a great thing. If you want to work with someone or you like the, you know, people see big wheels around or whatever, if you can, you know, you want to know who they are or how they roll and what makes them kick, you know, yep. out there and try and find a job with them, try and swindle your way in there. <laughs> so how um how long have you been going over to New Zealand for? Um, it's sort of gone in little patches a little bit. So I first went over yeah. in two thousand and one, and I done a season at Taimana Nui over there, and that was good. I enjoyed that. It was a bit of an eye opener, though. I won't lie, coming yeah. from Australia to to there, and then I went down south to about Clutha and that. And then after the first year, I probably didn't go back for. Oh, Maybe four years, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was with Darren Ford in Western Australia over with Crackers, and I was just like, wow. I was like, can you get me a job? Can I, <laughs> can I get a <laughs> Yeah, no worries. And I was like, oh, yeah, sweet. So I went down to his place for a few years, a few seasons down there, which is good. And I'm good mates with Darren, which is yep. awesome. And um, yeah, so I sort of went down there. But and then uh, last year I started coming back again. Obviously, I had a few years a bit of stuff going on in my life and then um when I started training for the record and stuff I wanted to sort of 
be in some highly productive areas and I've got some friends that are, have lived in Hawke's Bay before and they knew Roland and done a bit of work for him and that. So I so I sort of picked Tip's brain and he got me the job over here and I was lucky enough to come and work for Roly November, December last year and it was good. He had another mate, Hayden, that I knew. I'd done a couple of seasons with over here as well. So it's good to yep. have some common ground over here. And, yeah, it was awesome. It was, yeah, it was Real buzz working with Roland. He's yeah, he's an impressive human being on down tube, that's for sure. And a good bloke to go with. <laughs> he's really he's a good man, generally, yeah. He's good. Yeah, I can only imagine, man. Um I I noticed watching like the videos of your record attempt. You actually I I was I was surprised how smooth your style was for an Aussie. It's not something <laughs> you like even watching the other Aussies at record attempts, it's like there was definitely I could see like a Kiwi influence there. Like you had a real smooth sort of last side, and um, I think even your first leg and undermine would look pretty good. Was that is that something you'd worked on leading up to the record, or is that just how you shear all the time? Um, I definitely keep working on everything, really. So for a yeah. little bit of an edge on the sections of the sheep, I think. But I think the hind leg definitely sort of come from, yeah, probably the last few months I'd done in New Zealand, I think. Just picked up a lot of stuff, just sort of, you know, with a keen eye, working with good shearers like Rowley and Leon Samuels yeah. and stuff like that. You know, you're picking stuff up and sort of implying, implying it when you can and stuff like that. So, yeah, you just sort of keep your eyes open and pick up stuff that makes it easy, I think. Yeah. How how long had you had your eyes on the on the record attempt? Have you been thinking about it for a few years? Um, oh, yeah, definitely. To be honest, um, probably since I was about 20-odd years old, I think, because I'm not really into the show scene sort of thing. It's not really my yeah. jazz. Um, credit to those guys that do it. Like, they're, they're masters of their craft. They're awesome. But um, I don't know, I've always just been quite intrigued by it and um, probably wasn't always living the lifestyle to get there at times when I was younger, but I'd always, always thought about it. And probably around 2012, things sort of started changing and it sort of, you know, started doing a lot more, was getting into exercise and I was doing a couple of triathlons and different things and I could see the improvement in my body and my work and stuff and then sort of yep. sort of got the ball rolling, got a couple of people that give me some advice and um put a bit of faith in me and stuff and it sort of didn't work out at the start because other things happened in my life and then um yeah it just sort of fell in my lap really the so it did so I just sort of took it and ran which was good timing in my life really probably needed something to to feel to feel a bit of a void so it was good yeah mm, yeah no regrets I was you know we didn't get the result we wanted but I thought we'd done pretty awesome considering as a lot of people's first time and there's a couple of probably decisions that could have been a little bit different but it's hard to say without the experience sometimes so but i was happy yeah. with the tally in the end because we had a fair few variables go against us so i was happy with that 450 in merino yeah. use yeah. yeah i mean it's, who does that <laughs> yeah, like, it's, yeah. It's, was it probably like 10 shears of sean that tally on full wool merino use i don't know yeah well, if you put it in nine hours, it's like over 500 anyway. It's like 500 yeah. marks, so it's all yeah. good. What, um, so, like, there was a few things that went wrong on the day. It was pretty cold, I think. Was, yeah. there, <laughs> was there anything in the lead-up that you actually would change if you were going to have another crack at it? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, well, because of the season... It was really dry and tight, and they do a lot of um, cropping where we do the at Oxton Park where we done the record ten. Yep. And I approached those guys, and Paul, John, and Brad were amazing. They like that. Anything I asked of them, they'd done it like, and made heaps of time for us in the lead up. So credit to those guys. Nothing off their back, but um, yeah, yeah, we segregated like five hundred and forty ewes, so we drafted them off a mob of about eighteen hundred. So we picked out the best ones and we crutched them up and whatever. Yep. But um, because I, we wanted to keep them off the stubble because they've got a bit of mica and stuff out there in the sort of granity ridgy country as well. And yep. we just wanted to keep them off there for the cut. We're probably more worried about the cut than anything else. Obviously, it's a pretty big factor. And um, so when we're doing our sprints with the, the flock ewes, so they 
they worked it out so we could do those same black tag ewes a few days in the lead up so we'd be shearing through like that so we had like those exact same sheep or pretty much same age yep. sheep but two days like a day and a half before and we could do all my sprints we done my sprints while the shed was actually in work sort of thing so sort of all flew through quite nicely and um so with the sprints in the flock sheep they were a little bit lighter in condition but because they hadn't been um looked after quite as well they were actually a lot better shearing so they were they weren't quite so tight around the point so our sprint times were like they were really good like they were sitting around that 480 like no worries you know what i mean and then yeah that sat in my head pretty good. So I'm laying in bed the night before and like, massive storms come in. The whole room's lit up by like lightning and thunder all night, but it didn't even worry me. Like that physical and mentally prepared. And with the sprints, it didn't really worry me. But we didn't actually shear any of the um, record mob the day before. And then once we yep. got into them, they were tighter around the head and a bit more condition. And yeah, and plus we had well, there was a couple of hurricanes turned up in northern Australia, one in the west, one in the east. By the time they hit land, they pushed all this rain down. We had 90 mils of rain that week and then that big storm the night before and you're not allowed to use any artificial heating now. So, you know, they, they got quite tucked up and that's yeah. how it goes. So, <laughs> so what went right? Um, no, but... The cut was good. <laughs> the cut was unreal. Like my gear and that uh, click on my gear, yeah. he's, he's, it was just unbelievable. So during the flock sheep, yeah. you know, you could use two or three combs a run and you're only shearing like, 70 or 80 are running and then all of a sudden you're shearing like you know 56 57 eight sheep an hour and you're only using two combs around you know what i mean yeah. it's just a long time so we're changing the cutter every 12 minutes i think something like that we're working on yeah yep. and that was good like some of the cutters you know we're still cutting not too bad at the end of it and some of them were you know you're asking a couple sheep to go you're like you know like rocky when you know, when's the cutter coming up he's like right oh two more sheep and you're like yeah sweet no worries but um yep. Body was good through the day. Um, yeah, I couldn't couldn't fold it. I was surprised because if you've never gone into anything like that, you don't really know what to expect. Like, you know, you don't know if you're yeah. going to hit those tight, you know, those real hard spots through the day. And but I didn't, which was pretty good. It just sort of all worked out. But in saying that, it was like oh, probably eight to 11, 12 degrees through the day, depending on where the hailstorm. Like we had big hailstorm come in and just the wind and yeah, there was it was pretty mixed up weather wise. So probably wasn't yeah. as fatiguing on body as it could have been if it was a, a warmer day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you looked I mean you look good right to the end of the day, right? Like um like you didn't seem to slow down at all. Yeah, how much nah, we... Yeah right, you go. Yeah, how much um like do you think that would have been different had it been warmer? Nah. Or was you, nah, were you just that, you, you're completely prepared for it? 100%. So once we've found out we're going to do it and we approach it, well, you need the sheep first. So we got the got the sheep and yeah. everything was there and we'll see if you're going to chase something, your dream or something like that. So I just pretty much stopped drinking everything like 11 months out. I was like, right, oh, that's it, done. And I had a pretty good base fitness generally. And then um, approached Matt Luxton about doing some training and stuff, and he was like, "Yep, no worries. Put all the eggs in one basket and just yeah, started training." And yeah, yeah. And yeah, do you, do you take it? Good. Do you take it a bit easier once you start taking on extra training? Do you take it a bit easier in the shed, or back off a bit? Um. You... Yeah, I try and keep it a pretty consistent rate. Right? It's always good to stay in front, as a rule. Um, <laughs> in Australia or yeah. wise, certainly not in New Zealand, that's for sure. But um, yeah, it just sort of, you probably don't go as hard in some shape, but when you get in the good ones, you like to utilize it and sort of try and get your flow on a bit more. And but no, I sort of try and just shear at a constant, at a constant rate generally. So it didn't change that much really. And I th sort of wasn't, like I was getting sore, but it, it was sort of only more when I was in New Zealand doing like a lot of the grip training and stuff we had done, like I've sort of found it a lot harder. So in Australia, the training here in the Marinos probably wasn't that bad, I didn't think. But that was only yeah, up. Yeah. So it was. So it was um, my mate I was chatting with yesterday. I um, Like he's he's thinking about doing a record and he's like he's a bloody 
talented Shearer and um or he's talented five years ago now he's like just fucking good um but uh he was thinking about cheering a bit less like his um like, his partner wants to go back to work and they've got a young kid so he's mm-hmm. like oh, i might be able to you know shear a bit less and do a bit less travel but he's like but on the other hand i kind of want to do a record in the next couple of years and if i'm not shearing full time i'm not going to be able to do it and um i said to him i was like man i don't know if that's true because no other sport like no like if you're training through a marathon you don't run a marathon every day to train for it every other sport sort of has periodization and they build up and ebb and flow with their training is that something like if you were viewing that record as an optimum like optimum preparation do you think you'd be working five seven days a week in the lead up or would you sort of would, like ideally would three or four days a week be more of a perfect no i'm, uh, I'm no recordologist by any means but um yeah. I've no experience i've only attempted one but um i think five days is good five six days like as long as you've got that one rest day like i think it's pretty smart if but um yeah. you know it's has gone good work seven days and wheel in it too i think it's probably mental capacity depends how you think of it but I think if you were going to do a record, you certainly wouldn't want to be doing three or two days a week. You'd probably want, especially that last six months, you'd want to be doing five or six days every week, training, nutrition, you know, obviously no drinking, you know, no processed foods, just keeping it clean and smart and you know, good yeah. recovery. Need to sleep if you can. Having young kids, sleep's a bit of a bit of a dream away. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, he's... You just do the do the little things right, all those little one percenters right. Because I know um, I actually hurt my back. I've never had back injury. It was only like just throwing this bit of a kettlebell around, and I just sort of um, hurt my back a little bit. Nothing serious by any means, but I was just having a bit of trouble with it. And I went to I usually go to a chiropractor, and I've got a great chiro, and it was sort of a bit sat, stagnant still. So I went to a physio, and she's just saying, um, "You just got to do those little one percenters right." And it, it was right, like for the rest of my preparation, which was probably six months after that. Um, I just started making sure, you, you know, just really being pedantic on little things like stretching and doing all that. And so she worked yeah. for a uh, first grade rugby team, uh, sorry, rugby team in um, in UK. And she was saying when you rock up to do all the briefs in the morning, you know, you've got these 18, 19-year-old young bucks just cruising around, hardly stretching, doing their thing, just running on testosterone. Then you've got all these sort of superstars that are like 30, 33 or something at the end of their tether, and they're just doing everything, like 1% is just, you know, stretching, doing this while they're talking, just all those little things. They're the, yep. I think they're the things that will get you over the line. Yep. Yeah. How much, so it's not like how much time would you put into that, into all those extra things? Like on a shearing day, how much extra work are you doing? Uh, you mean like stretching and stuff like that? Yeah, yep. Um, I've been a pretty adamant stretcher probably for like 10 years or something I reckon because um, obviously I'm not a very big guy I'm only like 73 kilos sort of thing so I think it's good for me to work a lot smarter a bit more technique and stuff like that than trying to sort of demand it off a sheep and sort of yep. yeah a bit tricky and just watch other people how they get the sheep in and out especially in New Zealand like try and get some of the sheep out like they're big strong agile buggers over here so you've got to be sort of half smart about it you're going to get hurt one way or another but, um, yeah, just I was pretty lucky with Matt. Like, he, he does a lot of mobility as well. So you train sort of like four, four solid days a week and you sort of have like three days or two days of mobility, you know what I mean? Like, there was something to do every single day. Yeah, yeah. Five days training then, you know, on your days off, you're doing mobility and stuff. And that's – I think that's where you get a lot of your uh, – even extra strength, really, hey? Like, you just – easier to move around and just easier to control and just, yeah, I think mobility is a big thing. You just keep focusing on things like that, rolling, massage, chiro. Yeah. You're putting your body through a fair pizzling really because there's not many jobs in the world or sports where you're doing, you know, I train in the morning, so I do like an hour and a half in the morning, get up super early. So obviously when you come home from work and you're a father, you don't really want to have to go out and grind and spend an hour and a half out in your shed training. So you get up in that dead time in the morning and get out in the shed and make it happen out there. And that way you're done. I think it's an advantage training in the morning. Well, it was for me, I thought. 
I thought you could put probably put a bit more into it than in the yep. afternoon. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've I've found that too. Trying to like when I've been doing weights, like my deadlift loses fifty kilos from the morning. Really? Like if you, yeah, like if I'm if I want to do a deadlift in the morning, I can like before shearing, I can max it out. But after shearing all day, like stiff and sore, and like if it's a bit cold and yeah, you know, like yeah, I can't warm up and put it, put it right into it. So you feel like mm. I feel like my back's gonna snap. So yeah, yeah, just well, that's another thing. Safe, you know. Yeah, yeah. at the time when I actually went and because obviously my trainer was in England and that and he asked answer any question I had like very promptly was good. But I even ended up going to like um, a strength and conditioning coach and just yep. um. Just got just sort of perfected a couple of little sessions and just perfected on it like that because it's sort of you no know, as it, that was sort of more as your closer only like a couple of months out because everything was all pretty sweet but then sort of with the kettlebells and things would get heavier and the workouts would get pretty intense yeah you know, a couple of months out and that so I just sort of went there and told him what I was up to and yeah he was pretty good and he yeah I definitely felt a lot more comfortable under the barbell complexes and different things like that I think the confidence just generally in your body. Is good when you're yeah, training. So that's just to get the technique down for yeah. each I've, lift. I've done quite a bit of training before I started the record journey. So, yeah, I just wanted to perfect it really, get it down pat, save any injury. And it did. It worked. Like, yeah, my body's injury free and yeah, pretty lucky. Pretty lucky with injury. I've been shearing for 19 years and I haven't had a shearing injury really, apart from a few cuts and bruises and a couple of blown up wrists, which is just. A matter of when, not if, if you're a shearer, I suppose. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty amazing, really, isn't it? That, um, you know, like shearing isn't that injury. Like, we got a bad rap for back injuries, I suppose. But outside of that, it's not really an injury prone if you want to look at it as a sport. Like, compared yeah. to running, like, anyone goes running, they blow their ankles up and knees and mm. everything goes. But yeah, shearing seems to be pretty, um, yeah, like you can go for 10 years without a single injury like I have. Like, yeah. Again, yeah, cutting my hand open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. just a lot of common stuff comes involved, eh? Like obviously if you're yeah. in 120 kilo use, don't do 100 run in them. You know, if you're bugging around doing first cross use somewhere, you know, you don't have to bust your absolute guard all the time. You've got to be a bit smarter and sort of getting them out, I think. I think coming to New Zealand a few times actually sort of taught me how to um, – catch a sheep a lot different, you know what I mean? Instead of knocking them down yep. and getting them up off the all the time, which still happens from time to time. But, um, you know, if, especially in Australian Marinos and that, there's no need to drop them down. You only sort of pick them up, pop them up, put them back in your lap, and you know, you're out of the down tube and off you go. You know, you don't have to drag them down, you know, keeping them low on your body, loading up your back. Like, And one thing I did learn, like going to the record day, and that just was a bit of advice is just about um sort of – you know, embracing your abs and stuff when you're catching them, sort of bracing yourself, like keeping your body tight and, you know, yep. keeping it strong. So it's, yeah, I noticed that a lot on the day, which was good because those ewes were um, probably bigger than they needed to be anyway. But um, <laughs> it was good. Like I was super happy with my body on the day. Couldn't fold it. So how long, yeah. how's that? So since, what, so it's been like 18 months since you started prepping for the record. Is that about right? Um, so it was it'll... March last year, yeah. So March, April, May, June, yeah. So, yeah, something like that, yeah. 15, 15 16 months. months, yeah. How's like how's that affect since you've had the record attempt? How's that all that prep affected you, your day to day shearing? Like, would yeah. is that something you would go through even if you didn't have the record attempt? Would you go through that again to get the benefits? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good, like I love the fitness. Like once you're on the bars, you're good. You're getting, you know, you're you're living clean as 100. Yeah. percent So, you know, you every time you train, you get stronger. Like your body is just growing. Like the, yeah, it was, yeah, it was amazing. But the dieting, like I like to have a few beers and you know, like deep brownies, processed yeah. food, generally, you know what I mean, bread. Like yeah, if you're gonna do it, you've got to put all your eggs in one basket and keep it clean and yeah. So yep. the dieting is the only downfall of it, I think. I think the fitness and the lifestyle is great. I think as a human being, I think I grew a lot. Just um, 
yeah, that was definitely something I'm happy I come away with. Like, yeah, just definitely a better man generally. Yeah, I in think. what way? Uh, just a bit of clarity, I think. Being sober and working towards a goal and like a big goal, you know, you sort of work out who you are and where you want to be and, you know, give me clarity for the for the next couple of years of my life. And, yeah, so being a solo dad, as you probably know, you need to keep that bit of clarity about you and keep moving forward, eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find it, I get... um like the the day to day stuff, which is pretty important for kids, just bores the shit out of me. In all honesty, <laughs> <laughs> and if I don't have something like like that's why I've taken on projects like this podcast and and like I'm training for the Melbourne Marathon. But um, if I don't have something to work towards, I like yeah. I just start sleeping in, going to bed late, Netflix, like every bad habit. That doesn't cost yeah. money, I'll <laughs> I'll pick up. But um, once I I pick something to work towards, yeah, you get, you know, I can get out of bed earlier and be a bit more, get the kids off to kinder, and then I can go about my day. The things that sort of motivate me. For yeah, sure. It's all really though, isn't it? It's all yeah. simplicity. You know, being productive, productivity follows. Yeah. Yep. I um I. Signed up with Dylan Fowler for he's got this four year program, and I like actually pulled out of it on Friday because I realised the goals we set were like I thought. Oh, maybe in a couple of years I could uh, once I get back here and I can go for a record as well, maybe like a multi stand record. And um, I realised like I'm just not motivated to shear anymore. Like it's become a job. Like now that I've sort of let go of um, shearing, like now I'm running as a sport. Shearing's not the sport anymore. Now it's just the job. Yeah, it's that's like, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like it's, it wasn't something yeah. I expected at all. But once we started mm-hmm. going through the mobility and all that sort of stuff, I was like, "Fuck!" Like all I really want to do is run. But it was yeah. it took actually signing up with him and committing to the goal to realize that I didn't want to do it. It was, he might be in the right spot. Was, in terms of getting clarity, like that really focused me in on the problem. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. But see how it goes in a couple of years when your kids are a bit older and they mightn't be quite as tricky to work on. I, I don't know, I have any older kids, but when they're younger, they, they can be pretty time consuming trying to program them a bit with your parenting. I think as parents, <laughs> you've got to try and program them a bit. Eh? Like that's your job, I think. Make them understand yeah. things, and have a good perspective on life, and you know treat people right and all that sort of jazz. Maybe in a couple of years you might feel more comfortable. You might have a bit more free time. You probably get sick of running. You know, it's just probably just yeah, that yeah. buzz you're on, really. But um, yeah, I think, that's I think a lot of it's because because I'm not shearing, I can't apply any of it to what I like lifting yeah, the no, weights. It's shearing specific. I can't see the benefits of it straight away. Maybe. Whereas running, I get to go and run four days a week. So it was just yeah. it was just in terms of like where my money was going. I'd rather spend the money on a specific running coach that I could see. Probably like you just went to a weight coach or a strength and conditioning coach that can give me feedback that I can then apply straight away. Yeah, that was Better. sort of um, well, Mike gave me a, like all the feedback I needed. It was sort of just more my peace of mind sort of thing at the end of the day. Like. Yep. Yeah, like the bit of money I spent on Matt Luxton was money extremely well spent. Like it was, yeah, anyone that wants to imply stuff with their shearing and that should definitely jump on his stuff because it's unreal. Like I can't I honestly can't talk highly enough of it. Like yeah. I'm, yeah, my fitness and mobility and that is just, yeah, it's good. And it's sort of I haven't been doing a lot of training, but it, it's still carrying through. Like I'm definitely quite strong and endurant, which is good. So, yeah, definitely. So you're going to. So you you did the record attempt and then training fizzled out a bit? Uh, that... Yeah, I think after 11 months, <laughs> it just moved down the line, sort of turned it on for a bit and had my birthday and stuff cruising pretty close after that. So, and um, yeah, I think, yeah, it was a pretty bit of pill to swallow. I think if, you know, you've finally invested all that time and money into something you've always wanted to do and you fall a bit short... Three run short or something like that over the day. Yeah. 
and now uh, because I think we lost a couple of sheep over the day, so we've done like four fifty four or whatever. And um, yeah, now it's pretty hard to take. Like obviously, I didn't just go on a booze binge or anything like that, but um, it was just good to relax. I remember waking up the next day. I was like, oh, we had a pretty big night, and then um, yeah, I just felt like I was out of jail a little bit, to be honest. Like just got up, had yeah, toast right. for breakfast. Yeah, just fucking into it. Free man. You know, yeah, <laughs> go and eat two steak fries. I love fries. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. They were hot as fuck. Was to late them. They were good. <laughs> um, do you um? Do you think you'll do a, have another attempt? Uh, I reckon. I don't think we'll let um defeat define us in that thing. Like we had a lot of, we had plenty of speed to do it. Like in those flock sheep. So it's just yeah. a matter of getting the ball rolling and find some better sheep and. Because, you know, they're probably bigger than they needed to be. But I wanted to do try it locally anyway. It was always a bit of a gamble doing it, you know, sort of over in Young, sort of southwest slope, said to the river sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of a gamble and sort of had a bit chucked at us through the day. So that's how it goes. But at least yeah. we know where we are, know how he can, can take it. And, you know, we've got that speed there. And we can find a few more compact sheep, you know. Yeah. And you learn it too, like... Um, I haven't been to a lot of records, really. I went to the three-stand one up with Bo, Bobby and Muddy. And I went yep. to Muddy's second weather one and I was going down south for the main shear once and we dropped into one of Stacey's nine-hour attempts as well. And then I went over to Lou's attempt and supported him. And, yeah, no, you pick up a lot of things, like especially from Lou's one, like, you know, seeing a bloke shear at 500 pace on Marino U's, you can see that it's it's a possible thing and, you know, you can just see what he's up to and what's working and a few little things that possibly didn't work. Not that much didn't work for him, but, um, yeah, that was good. It was a really good buzz being over there. It's good. Yeah, right. Is that, <laughs> is that part of the – oh, obviously, yeah, you said you're moving over there, maybe chasing better sheep. Do you think that might be the place to do another record attempt? 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 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 It's that, I, I, think, was, yeah. I, I went over there um, around Corrigan probably four or five years ago and I was blown away just actually by the size of the Merino U's, like that they're, how small the Merino U's could be. I'd never seen Merino U's yeah. that little. Like, yeah, around, I don't know, maybe yeah. like 35 kilo U's and it's like full grown. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing, it's and the wool just falls off them. Yeah, yeah, no, they're swimming. Yeah, it's good. And they're getting a bit of rain over there at the moment. They're getting having quite a wet winter, so that's got to be a good thing to a degree, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, again, I think. Um, oh, maybe it's a bit different around Young, but back to what my mate was saying around Tottenham, he reckons a lot of the farmers there are saying they're getting like ten percent lambing. So yeah. there's not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a different world, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's going to be the only places with sheep might be where it rains, I think, for the next year or so. Yeah, we get something. So. That sounds pretty good. If you go for those buggers out there, farmers and shearers and wool handlers, all the above. But um, yeah, I'll try not to sort of go in those areas as much. I like the consistent work as much as I can. Yeah, so I think especially when you're young and keen, I think it's the time to get in and make your dosh. And yeah, I don't know. I don't like sitting around too much. Get a bit bored, a bit stuck. <laughs> Spend too much money at the end of the day. Too many bad yeah. habits. Yeah. yeah. What What do you think? What do you think you'd be doing if you weren't shearing? Yeah, that's a fair question. Um, I don't know. I was sort of only sort of sure from when I left school. At 15 and then at 20 I started doing a bit of pre testing. So I'd done that yep. for like sort of five seasons. It was like four and a half months. So from January to sort of nearly June. Oh yeah, May, June sort of thing, five months. And um yeah, I actually missed it. Hey, like it was a pretty cool experience. I got to travel, do a lot of Western work and met some awesome people and some really good stockmen and people I'm still friends with today. But um that life sort of wasn't for me. And I come back to shearing and I'm just like and loved it. Like even the bad days are good. I'd rather work with sheep and do that. But honestly, I do not know what I've never really thought about it, to be honest. 
<laughs> oh, when I was younger, I wanted to be a volcano. We'll just work with volcanoes, but that was a bit far fetched, I think, with my um, commitment to school. So, <laughs> from what I understand, science is all about passion anyway. If you ever yeah. want to follow up on that dream, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, so are you from a shearing background, like in your family? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Both my parents are off a farm, so yep. we spent a lot of time on those farms growing up. And my dad was a contractor for about, I don't know, 16, 18 years, something maybe, maybe a couple of years longer, something like that. Yeah, just yep. south of Dubbo. So, yeah. So that was. Yeah, right. So you knew a bit yeah. about it. Yeah, I've seen the farming side of it, the contracting side of it, the shearer side of it. I can sort of see it from everyone's perspective, which I think makes maybe my shearing life a bit more accept- acceptable in certain ways, like when you talk about conditions and working with people and how to, yeah, I've sort of seen it all from different angles. So yeah. easy to accept. No one's perfect at the end of the day. Eh? That's right. I think I um take my hat off to most contractors i reckon that's the toughest job oh. in the industry like and especially the guys that are shearing full-time and contracting like that's i don't know how they do it it's a big workload yeah yeah shearing yeah. shearing all day and then being on the phone at smoko lunchtime after work like dealing, dealing with other people's <laughs> shit there's like and yeah um, that, that's a rough gig and then copping yeah. all the flack that they cop yeah. yeah, and most of them don't ask for it either. Some would, but majority of them don't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. So, um, you want to talk a bit about charity stuff? Um, or just more of um, yeah, anyone in need. If you see people out there fundraising, generally, hey, I think if you know if you got a few spare bucks, or if you see someone organising something to raise money, whether it's for MND or cancer, care flight, like if they're going on a hockey trip or something like that, doesn't matter for school. Like I think if anyone yeah. can throw a buck somewhere, being the recipient of quite a bit of charity over the last few years, um, I think it'd be only fair if I, you know, if I can give back or if anyone else can, like, you know, a few bucks here, a few bucks there, it all adds up if everyone's doing it sort of yeah. thing. And people putting their own time and money in to do these fundraisers and stuff like that. I think it's an extremely noble thing to do. And I think it's something that every human should support. To be how, does it, how does it, uh, like, how does it feel being like, obviously nobody wants to be in this position, but how does it feel actually being the recipient of charity? It's difficult. It is if, um, you know, you've worked, you know, your whole life and, you know, you never really had to ask for anything like that. And then next thing you know, people are going out of their way, putting on different fundraisers and the money comes in. It's extremely overwhelming. It's sort of changed my life and perspective a lot, I think, yeah. Like some people are strangers, yeah. some people are your best friends, some people are just friends you haven't seen for a while. Like it's amazing which people have the biggest heart that you've sort of come across in your life. And I think, yeah, and even, you know, like everyone's at different stages in their life too. So when I was going through it, you know, there's people in different stages of their life. Some could give time, some could give money, some couldn't give anything. So yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's just something I think is very noble. And I think meeting people um, that are in situations like that when you're at a desperate plea for fighting for your life really like i know people we met on Haley's journey you know some have got brain tumors some have got motor neuron disease and just to see how they conduct themselves is enough for me to give up my time and you know money that i can not huge lumps but you know just just bits to to give back because when you can see how strong and courageous those people are when they're facing something that we probably may not ever face is just yeah, the contribution that those people leave behind is, you know, it's phenomenal, really. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I think I've only had a couple of touches where, um, like when my son was born, he was in the, in the NICU unit, like with all the premature babies. 
Mm-hmm. Um, just because he had a bit of trouble and we were at a low risk hospital, so he was under observation for a week. And there was parents that have been, they'd been, they'd had premature babies, and they'd been in that unit living, more or less, given up their jobs, yeah. left everything, and stayed there. You know, like six months, nine months. They'd been living at the Ronald McDonald House and just, just to be with their kid every day. And it's like a lot of those people don't have. You know, like you don't know, they may not have family support, they may not have anything. And it's yeah, you know, like I walked out of there, the Ronald McDonald house put us up for a week. And I walked out of there and paid I just handed over a deposit for what I would have paid yeah. to stay at a hotel because I knew we could afford it yeah. um quite easily. But I actually in in my life I don't see like you see the the charity um, events and everything, but I don't actually see the people that often. I don't come in contact with them, and it's it's only a couple of times where I have. But it um it definitely brings it home, eh? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. yeah. Was that? I mean, before you went through that with Haley, is that something you were aware of, or no? To be honest, I thought of running my own race and to be honest I think a lot of it went over my head I think until yeah. something like that happened and, oh, you know if you're cruising through the supermarket or something and there's people there selling a couple of tickets Lions Club or something like that you know you throw them a couple of bucks people ever come to my house like kids selling chocolates and stuff like that to go on you know sport trips like bang yet yeah, no dramas you know, a couple of bucks here and there but never yeah. really thought about it to be honest never been pretty blessed never really had any quite heavy sort of come into me or my family as much growing up so it was a bit of a it was a huge kick in the teeth when it all sort of kicked off sort of thing yeah yeah so where did like how did that start um it started uh well it was a genetic thing Haley had it in her family so mm-hmm. um she actually lost her mum her sister and her brother so it was sort of that was I didn't grow up where Haley grew up either. I didn't grow up in Young. I grew up in Oberon, so I didn't never even really heard of it at all, to be honest. And then um, as I got to know Haley, and obviously you don't talk about things like that on the first date or anything, but uh, as thing goes on, you know, you talk about parents and different things, and you're like, oh wow, that's crazy. But to be honest, I never we never really looked at it like as if she was ever going to be diagnosed or anything like that. It's just yeah, I don't know. People can contract anything anytime. I think we probably all got something lying in it genetically. You know what I mean? It's just a matter of triggering it, whether it's MND or cancer or any of those bloody things out there. But yeah, um, yeah she just um, started sort of losing her thong a little bit, like as she was walking, a flip flop jand or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, just sort of a toe stop working sort of thing. So, and then yep. started getting pains up a leg. So we went to the specialist and, yeah, he was clinically concerned and sort of all started like that. So, But by the time you, you've you sort of worked out what's happening, you've lost 70% of your neurons anyway. So you're sort of already yeah. you know, shot the beat, really. You know what I mean? You just – yeah, so some people can live for 10 years with when you get a like, start down your, in your legs and that because obviously there's no vital organs and any, anything down there. But um, in Haley's case, it was only like 15 months, I suppose, from diagnosis. So every case is different. It's all sort of problematic. Yeah. But, yeah, so that was that was how that was. Yeah, it was pretty difficult. So, yeah, just lots of support and, yeah. Yeah, so did you, did you have to give up work at that point? No. We you... were, no, so Haley, she's pretty bloody tough. Like, she... Uh, she, yeah. yeah, she cruised around because we had a 13-month-old daughter when she was diagnosed. So she cruised around on a walking stick for a while and we um, took on a bit of alternate um, practices and stuff like that. Obviously, there's no cure. So we, she took on a lot of fasting and just super clean, natural living and stuff like that. She actually done 21 yeah. days of water. She's done a big, huge water fast. It pretty much resets your whole body. I don't think I could live yeah. on 21 days of water, that's for sure. But um, I think that definitely helped her, um, mentally especially. Um, 
but yeah, so as time went on and she lost mobility and she was in a wheelchair, we got a young girl, Jess, to come and help with Stella and Haley. So Haley could obviously still talk. She was a pretty strong talker, very positive human. Yep. And so we could command Jess around and Stella's cruisy as. So they just all sort of worked on that. Stella used to help Haley out as well. Like she was funny. She was only young, but she could sort of, she knew what was happening, I think, to a degree. And yep. um, she got to help out around the house too. That You wouldn't see many two-year-old kids sort of doing what she was doing at, at two anyway. But um yeah, and I did. I, I went back to um, three days a week. I was pretty lucky with my contractor at the time. He was pretty understanding, as you, as you would be. And um, so we sort of went three days a week and then come back a full week every now and then. And then um, just before Halley passed, I actually had two days left of work and then we are going to – I was just going to stop sort of in a spot where we could then. And, yeah, and it sort of all just sort of crept up on us. We thought we had a, quite a bit of time left, really, another six or 12 months perhaps. but sort of come to a sudden sudden stop so yeah and then i had four months off work just to sort of chill out that's what we agreed on so probably the only benefit of going through a lot of long-term terminal illness is we get to have some pretty heavy conversations so we had a bit of a plan up so sort of you know if anything was to happen to Haley, we knew what to do so i just sort of just acted on those plans and took some time off and chilled out with Stella and it was good four months being a single parent's a long time too as you said like it's a tough job like my yeah mums and dads that do it like it is a big job it's a big big yeah. job so yeah I was happy to go yeah, back especially to when you take on you know the full responsibility of it as well yeah that's you know, right yeah Yeah, right. Man, that's heavy stuff, eh? Hey? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, Shit. Yeah. But, um, but like I said, like Hallie was a rock through it all. Like she, I think she just continued to inspire more and more people as, as things went on, you know what I mean? Like when you're facing something like that, and she certainly yeah. changed my life. She always would have, even if she um didn't get sick. But just people around her just changed their perspective and things, I think, even on um, how they approach life. and medicine and different things like that like yeah she certainly was a game changer for a lot of people i think yeah mm. what um <clears throat> so that would have been a like obviously the um, raising money would have been a huge part of the record attempt as well yeah we've done a that... bit of a fun right yeah rocky and i put one on and then um yeah. Probably didn't get as many bums on the seats as we wanted, but we ended up raising uh, maybe like four grand or something. On We got like a guest speaker come in. Andrew Matthews is really yeah. good if anyone out there wants a really good um, keynote speaker. Yeah, Andrew Matthews is awesome. He was really good, just a, a sort of inspirational sort of guy. Real good fella, easy to book. He wasn't overly expensive or anything like that. So we ended up just – putting all the money back to MND. I think that was the buzz, sort of the journey I was on. Probably financially for yeah. me, it probably wasn't the hardest thing to do. But I think, uh, you know, still being so fresh, not that you really get over it in a hurry, but I just wanted to um, – I just wanted to give as much back as I could, I think, just because after, like you were saying, you know, receiving so much charity and big hearts and that coming your way, I just wanted to, I don't know, give a bit back and show people that I really did appreciate it. Because you can never thank people enough. You can shake their hand, give them a cuddle and a kiss. But, uh, yeah, because yeah. catching in that situation, like, you know, you just, you know, bills don't stop. Everything's still rolling in. Things break. You need new things. Registration on cars. You know, your life's still running at the same pace as it was before it all happened. So, yeah, just wanted to give it all back. So I think if it was to happen again, I'd probably be more smarter about it financially perhaps. But we'll worry about it when it time comes yeah did you get like did you um get any assistance from centrelink or anything um no it was to be fucking honest it was <laughs> we're doing, how we don't have yarn room, they bloody near turn you off it like it's a big job like yeah you pretty much sort of have no job to be able to deal with those guys and spend that much time yep. sorting it out like carers and like carers um thing and 
So I would have had like a carers and uh, the doll or whatever at the same time, I suppose. But it was it was nothing. You know what I mean? It was like three hundred something bucks a fortnight. It was ridiculous. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it's well, yeah. easier just to work and just get Jess on the job. You know what I mean? It was good and it worked out really well. And you know, we kept Haley out of hospital the whole time, so everything worked out that way. Yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah. I, I I went through with Centrelink, man, and it's a nightmare. No, it was, I think they just yeah, so like four you months of no it, income. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, once yeah, you're I, on it, it's it can... too bad, but. But, yeah. but I was pretty lucky too, like being um, attempting that record locally, like I had a lot of sponsorship. So I was pretty lucky there, like credit to all those guys. They were good. And yeah. Honiger jumped on board, which were awesome, and they helped me out a bunch too. So you can't ask for any better gear than that. Yeah. So what yeah. – um, actually going back to the record attempt, I had a question earlier. What? How much input – do you have on the day with your gear? Um, you, well, yeah. You just so, trust yeah, I your think gear, every, man. Oh, 100%. Trust him yeah. with my life. Um, I think you've got to know the bike <laughs> a little to a degree yeah. too. Well, I, I do a um, mutual friend and, yeah, always liked the guy. He's good, always respected him. And he's, you know, he's, he's achieved a bit too. And he's a real straight up and down guy, which is easy to work with. And um, we actually got clean up oh, maybe how far? Maybe a couple months. I'm just trying to think when it was. So we'll say like two months or something before the record attempt. And um, we come up and we done a bit of shearing so we could work out. Obviously, he has sort of a method that he does his combs up with. And we sort of started on that and then maybe sort of worked our way back to where my hand sat. So we had a, yep. had a pretty big idea before the day. And then he cruised up before the record attempt and we just sort of perfected it to those sheep and we had, so it was on the Saturday. So on the Thursday afternoon, we started doing sprints and on the Friday morning we're doing sprints. So we had all that gear pinpointed and yeah, but as the day went on and it got colder and especially towards the end of the day, like it was just getting worse and worse and there'd be hailstorm come and wind. And so we just sort of, yeah, I just trust him. Yeah. Whatever. He knew yeah what I, was, was up. I was thinking it's kind of weird because it's not, um, you know, like shearing for like you've been shearing for nineteen years. You said, how often would you have somebody else load a comb up for you, or pick Probably a comb for it? Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, the heart of that motor, I could tell you, it was, it was a mad buzz. Just you know, get your massages. Yeah. Good thing we couldn't use those heaters out the back because we needed the heaters at Smoko anyway. When we're getting a massage <laughs> and that oil, cold, it was yeah. good. Me and my masseuse and my car, I got some heaters, so it's a bonus. Always positive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah. But the gear, yeah, I just hum like, so we're pretty lucky. And, yeah, you, Clinton knew where he wanted to have the gear and stuff like that, like cutter-wise, and we talked about different things and what kind of combs I like and we talked about the sheep and we obviously take in, like, what season it was. They're going to be a little bit bony and – Stuff like that, so yeah, yeah, it worked out pretty well. Couldn't fault the gear at all. What sort of combs were did you have on? Uh, we ran ninjas all day. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah, we just certainly needed that bit of point because they sort of probably weren't as open as the flock sheep and that. So we sort yeah. of needed that bit of point. Yeah, and you're obviously not going to go into a record using narrow gear either, to a degree. Uh, yeah, I reckon the ninjas probably one of the most underrated combs out there. Especially, yeah, they're like 697s and, yeah, they just ride the skin quite well. You can't even – I've used them a lot in, like, first cross use and stuff like that as well. Yeah, but, yep. Yeah, amazing game, yeah. Yeah, I think they, they changed them a bit probably two years ago. They're, I think they're a little bit – they enter a bit better than they used to. But – um. I, I find that they either go or they don't go. Like, there's a specific sheep they work for. 100%. Whereas, yeah, yeah. like, you think about, like, your huges, like, the other wider combs, like your huges and maybe, I don't know, Express, Freak. They're kind of all-rounders, but your ninjas are kind of like a specialist comb when you're in those better, freer comb and sheep. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, the open combing ones, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, if the sheep are going to be really light in condition and they're a bit bony, like, you, you know, your ninjas probably aren't going to ride as well as your, your freaks and your expresses and stuff yeah, like that. You just got a bit pretty of, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, that's an hour, man. Cool. Yeah, I'm busy. Happy days, yeah. No, it's, um, it's good. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? Um... Don't know. Um, I don't know. We covered a fair bit of stuff, though. Eh? Yeah. Did you want to talk good. about I thought... work conditions hey? or any work conditions well, or shoes? I do, but I was like, I was actually just talking to my girlfriend before we started. I was thinking I might start keeping the episodes to an hour, uh, and yeah. um, and and hoping that. Whenever I'm talking to someone, they've, there's more to talk about. They might come back on, if you know what I mean. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I'm just trying to sort of really important. Well, anyway, I think. God, I don't think we upset anyone, which was good. Kept it pretty. <laughs> well, I'm happy. I'm happy, and you're happy. That's the main thing. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I actually, watched, um, I started listening to yours and Dylan's um, one day, but I don't know when you got kids, sometimes it just doesn't always work out. So I listened to his one yeah. a little bit. Then I seen you done another one with um, I was it someone someone do with Blackie? Was it a lady? Yeah, Vanessa Murray. Yeah, she's um, she's started up a workshop just for it's it's sort of personal development. Mm-hmm. So um, it'll just be, it'll be just, it's kind of like around goal setting and um, I don't know, like habit forming, that sort of stuff. Like maybe not yeah. people who want to do records or there's, and I think Dwayne's doing like the, they'll do some in shed training as well. Yeah. 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 I'm definitely yeah. going to some stuff up over there. Over there with the trainers and yeah, stuff. Good. i some good trainers. And yeah, and like a lot of the stuff she's doing is, um, I suppose it's alternative. Like it's all, it all works, but um, <laughs> if I think if you haven't, if you haven't um, heard of anything like that before, it can be, seem a bit weird, but it's like um, anchoring words. power words to your knuckle or to your earlobes or, and you touch it yeah. and then it switches on that sort of stuff. You might think it's a bit um voodoo or something but yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean i was um with a lot of grief and stuff like that um went through things like i even when Hallie was sick i went through a lot of insomnia which is probably one of the hardest things i've ever had to deal with in my life um so it was just a matter of like once i got into meditation and sort of doing that and you sort of got to tailor it to whatever you're up to and because everyone's mind works differently and you know you're reading books and you know, podcasts on meditation and different stuff like that. And then once you've read a few, yeah, they can get very similar and it's sort of a bit hard to, to read them all. So you just sort of pick the eyes out of something and sort of what works for you, just go with it. I think it's important. Yeah. 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 But I think meditation yeah. should be something to, do, to be honest. I, I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't have been where I am today just generally as a human without meditating after going through all that. Eh? Yeah. How, how yeah. much meditation do you do? i would be doing it every morning. So it would be like pretty much the first thing I'd do in the morning. So you get up, have some water, meditate. I'll get up, shower, water, meditate, and then go and train every day. Yeah. So sort of would probably meditate on average oh, probably just shy of 10 minutes, I think. Yeah. Sort of I'd get there and I'd – just sort of get comfortable and do some breathing and then I'd just say a few mantras, some things that I'd, I still say today, um, just, you know, just positive stuff, a couple of things that Haley used to say, just things that keep you going and I think that's what's important. Depends where you're up to. Yeah. If you're manifesting something big like records or an, a run or something like that, then you've definitely got to do a few mantras that are going to, you know, keep pushing forward towards that because – it is easy to fall off the rail a little bit, so you just keep keep following that track and just keep enforcing that in your mind. And when you're doing it early in the yeah. morning, well, then you've triggered that to do it all day. 
you know what I mean, to be on that positive thought because even, you know, if you are shearing and conditions aren't always the best, sheep aren't always the best, so you just got to, you know, just got to remember why you're there and just keep keep focused really because I find yeah. it hard to concentrate a lot of the time, like just generally maybe I think everyone's brain works pretty fast, but even shearing and that, like it's, you know, sort of try and discipline on thinking about what you're up to instead of more thinking about what's happening on the weekend. Yeah, yep. So keeping you sort of present, yeah, or focused while you're shearing. Well, um, I know, sort of a a strange memory. I had a I had a mate who was into um, or well, he's right into like his raves and electronic music, and yeah, and he put on he put on a his playlist once when we we're, we're working out near Broken Hill somewhere. Oh, not Broken Hill, bloody Cooper Pedy in South Australia, like out in the station country. And he's um, he's put on this song. And, like, we've been working with this team for months. So we'd gone through all the other playlists. And we finally put on Bo's playlist. And it was um, the first song went for 48 minutes of just, like, this trance electronica type Ooh, stuff. Okay. And, and, like, it was a nine-stand shared and everybody hated it. But... What I noticed was that when they put the other music back on, you're, I suppose, like emotionally, like if you're listening to the music, you're up and down with each song. Like each song's completely different and you're getting a different feel and you're like up and down all day. Whereas at least with his 48 minute song, it's like, it's not just one beat, like the song ebbs and flows, but it's actually consistent. And I got to like, not, not think about music for 48 minutes like it was just background noise and i actually really liked it so um now i find like i listen to podcasts when i do go shearing i tend not to listen to music anymore but um if the my head my bluetooth headphones go flat i actually leave them in now and block out all that noise so i'm not getting that up and down all day from the music that the shearers are playing no I think music's a necessity. I think I'm not um, – I do listen to some podcasts, but um, yeah. I'm probably – it's not for me at work, I don't think. I think I like the music. I, I like a few ballads and that, to be honest. I think uh, you recognise certain periods of your life. I listen to my music for a lot of work. I've got my Spotify and stuff, and we've been listening to it most yeah. days. It can get a bit boring, but I don't know. I've got a lot of songs on there that you know take you back to chapters in your life, whether it's your youth or wherever you, yeah. wherever you are. Extremely motivating to me. I'm a big music person, 100%. Listen to music all the time. Been listening to like lots of 50s and stuff lately, like some <laughs> old. <laughs> I met someone and yeah, she's been playing a lot of old stuff, so it's been yeah. like old stuff. It's been good. It's been a good buzz. It's it's good to be on something different and yeah, it's good. Yeah. Do you find you pick, um, or have you ever thought about it? How do you like if you find you're picking a genre like a 50s music? Do you see a reason for doing that? No, oh, it probably or is it just a person to a degree, and if it's a positive yeah. thing, I think it, it it can get you on that buzz. Um, I think everyone's got a couple of songs that you know, or the, the genre. So yeah, I listened to a lot of house music when I was younger, and you know, been to, been to a few raves, and and I actually started listening to country music only like I don't know, maybe five years ago, and I actually quite like country now. It's good, you know, it tells a story, yeah. and I think. I don't know. I think once you've, once I went through what I went through, I was more than happy to listen to stories because I guess I had a story myself to tell. So yeah. I really relate to a lot of it. And they're all productive people, eh? Like I listen to a bit of rap and stuff too, but not a lot. But um, yeah, I just I just like the storytelling. To be honest, I like a good good story in the song. Yeah, I, I mean, the only reason I asked that, I found that um, when I'm feeling flat. Like I'll pick a lot of high, like if I find myself picking a lot of high energy music, like rap or metal or rock or something, I can think back and think, oh, I'm probably feeling a bit flat now. And when I'm picking, I don't know, like things like John Butler or more sort mm-hmm. of hippie, peaceful music or reggae or something, it's probably, yeah. I'm probably feeling a bit stressed, you know, like mm-hmm. I need to sort of be brought down a bit. Yeah. yeah. I've sort of drawn that. 
like I don't I don't pick the music consciously, but when I'm picking the music or what I feel for, I can think back and like, oh, I probably, you know, I might be a bit stressed or a bit flat or a bit str- highly strung at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah, it all comes in waves, doesn't it? It's life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the kind cool, of shit that I think about. <laughs> it's good. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm a good bit of metal anyway. It's good. It's a bit of metal. Good. I was, you know, 90s music's probably like, what I listen to the most, you know, when you're a teenager, stuff like that. So, like a bit yeah. of 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Like a bit of 80s rock too. You can't beat it. You know? A bit of Motley Crue and whatever. A bit of high intensity guys, mad hair yeah. and leathers run, doing their thing. Have Marcus you seen the, they've got a, a movie, yeah, no, a movie on Netflix? I haven't seen it. I'm waiting for the right time. It'll be awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it looks pretty it intense. Yeah, it looks awesome. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. So it is. Yeah, cool. cool. All right. All right. We might wrap Thanks. it up there, man. Yeah, all good. I didn't get taken yeah. anyway. Cool. Yeah, that was good. Love when you get 